think about our lizard brain for a minute, just the whole complex of lizard brain. So in the, in the lizard brain, there are things that we do automatically. We don't have any control over our heart rate. Um, we don't have any control over our lungs. We don't have any control over our heart pumping, I should say. We don't have any control over the blood flow. We don't have any control over digestion as a rule, okay? But we do. So the amygdala is the, is the center of our brain that, that holds all of our um, trauma for good reason. It is part of our lizard brain and it is part of the center where it goes to, uh, to collect it, things that have caused us terrible stress or, or distress. And it holds that in a place for us to remember for safety. So that when we are confronted with this thing again, and it can be as simple as a smell, it can be as simple as a as a space or a place. It can be as simple as a person. It can be as simple as, a, as, an, as an event. Something will trigger us. And it doesn't even have to be something terribly, um, terribly traumatic, if you will. Often our amygdala takes hold of that because we haven't given ourselves resonant warmth around that particular thing. Because we didn't receive resonant warmth, we trap that in the amygdala for future use. It's like sticking a pin in it or putting a big old, a big old sticky note in the book and saying, yeah, I'm highlighting this one so that we can go back to it easily. So the amygdala is designed to hold things. And the interesting part about the amygdala is it doesn't allow for time. Why should it? It's, it's, it's keeping a pin in all of these important things. Why should it um, say, well, this thing actually happened to you when you were three, honey? Do you really think this really needs to be continued to be a thing? It doesn't because it recognizes that that was a pivotal event that has that has shaped you and caused you to um, need to stay safe. You're still alive because you kept that you kept that memory or that circumstance or this situation. The amygdala takes hold when, and, and it doesn't have to be some, it, it can be just as simple as I've had a really, really long day today. I'm exhausted. I am so depleted. Your body holds on to that information and says, whoa, she's in a scary place. You're not going to sleep. You're not taking good care of yourself. We need to grab a hold and take charge. So the amygdala doesn't sense time, which is one of the other reasons that um, like big deals, like car accidents we were in, if we pass a car accident, we're automatically reminded us and we're automatically pulled back as, as if that event just happened. It's one of the reasons that, that things that just happened to us go right there, right? We go right to that place. Um, it's not just bad things either. I have a little bit of a fun memory with my daughter. She and I were moving things out of the garage to make space for a big a big system of, of, um, shelving that was going to be put up in my garage. So we had rented a pod. And so we were moving things out into the pod and Jackie and I were carrying this thing. And I tripped over the outside of the pod and I face planted in her boobs. <laughs> we both could not stop laughing. And that whole time from the trip to the face plant, I can still see it clearly as if it just happened. So it doesn't have to be something negative, nor will that probably pull me into a food situation. But that, that particular thing does pull me into that the, every time. We call it the video because she and I both have our own perspective on that event. But my point is that those kinds of events are definitely stored in the amygdala. But the other things that keep us in the amygdala are anything that is going to cause us to go to the fight, flight, or freeze. So any stressful circumstance or any situation or any emotional conglomeration. So think about every afternoon or evening. Um, if, you, if you tend to go to food at three in the afternoon, or if you tend to go to food at seven or eight in the evening, think about what other circumstances are around that might be causing your amygdala to take hold. We can move things out of the amygdala by resonant warmth. 
recognizing that, and that's what this does right here. That's what this is right here. This is resonant warmth on crack because you're, you're recognizing that everybody's paying attention, everybody's listening, everybody cares about this, inf this information and everybody wants to, um, to, to learn from it. You're recognizing the support system that you have here. It feels good to be on these calls generally. It feels good to be on these calls and that's because it's giving us that resonant warmth. So when we have that resonant warmth, we're automatically pulled to that resting place, that, that quiet place, that safe place. This is a safe space. We don't need to be in our amygdala here. We don't need to be in that fight, flight, or freeze. We don't need to be worried that there's a lion around the corner because there's all this community here supporting us. And we, as evolved humans, we're no longer in those caveman days. We no longer need to have somebody on the lookout for the, the lion or tiger or bear because we have locks on our doors. We have a cell phone we can call for emergencies. We have free will to get out of whatever or go wherever we want. And we choose to not go to things that feel unsafe. Okay, I'm digressing a little bit on the amygdala, but I wanna make a point about it. It's a really big deal because when we, at, when we are in the amygdala, when our brains go to that place, it literally shuts off everything else because it's trying to keep us completely safe. It's literally recognizing some sort of real physical danger. So it does all sorts of things. It, 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 um, it literally um, sensitizes us to um, potential threat. We're on alert. Now, the interesting part about this is that the that the the when the amygdala is 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 enacted, we also need to soothe ourselves somehow. So how do we soothe ourselves? What's our go-to? Food. I just learned last night. God bless Sarah Payton. I just learned last night from a, listening to a 2016 lecture that she did on the default mode network, which is another topic that takes takes precedent here. But I just learned yesterday that that when we are um, in uh, when we're in a place of activating our addictions, we're activating dopamine. So when we're activating dopamine, it actually shuts off the default mode network. Which I find fascinating. And I'm actually going to ask her some questions this week because I have a class with her on Thursday. I'm going to ask her if there's another way for us to either enact a dopamine hit in that moment. Anyway, I'm digressing. I don't want to go into that right now. Let's go back say to the one more time. On the say what one more time? About when we're the in activating, our, when we're in our addictions, we're, we're activating our dopamine. Right. So think about, think about dopamine for a minute. It's an anticipation hormone, literally an anticipation hormone. It's the thing that we feel when we're, uh, when we're in new love, when we're on our first date, it's that feeling that we get when we're anticipating something new, something exciting. Um, a party is coming up that we've been planning and we're excited about yeah. dopamine is active during that time because we're anticipating something. The reason we never feel totally comforted after we eat that stuff is because the dopamine is, 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 has already been enacted, but the food itself isn't, isn't solving any problems. It's actually making us feel worse. So we recognizing we're looking at the wrong part of the problem. The reason that we felt so good was because the dopamine hit, we don't actually need to eat to get the dopamine hit. How many of us watch the food channel for the reason of, <laughs> we, don't, we don't realize, oh, I wanna learn some new recipes for my family. Well, no, uh -uh, you wanna get a dopamine hit because that's what's happening when you're watching the food channel. Hmm. So, so let's go to the fog associated with the amygdala. Think about, um, to me, it's, it, it, that's, a great, that's a great definition. To me, what that is, is the amygdala has grabbed a hold. We're in a, we're in a fight, flight, or freeze mode. And our parts, you can use parts language. 
pieces of us, parts of us are, are in that, okay, now what do we do now? What do we need to do here? And they take over. And to me, that's the fog that you're hearing or feeling is they're taking over and removing, disconnecting the prefrontal cortex. When you're in the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex doesn't work. It doesn't need to because we're acting on instinct. Amygdala is instinct. And our instinct is to eat. The prefrontal cortex is offline because it doesn't need any, no, we're not going to have a meeting. We're not going to do, you know, a planning session. No, we're not going to do, you know, a, uh, we're not going to do a, a, a study on which is the best course of action here. No, we're, we need to react right away. That's what the amygdala does. So pulling off the free prefrontal cortex, there's no project managers available when, when we're in that, um, that fight, flight, or freeze mode. So the amygdala takes hold. Now what? What do we do? We can't do anything because the amygdala won't let us. We do what is instinctual. Why is overeating in instinctional? Instinctional. So a piece of it is the reasons why we go to the food in the first place that I just found out last night. I always thought it was our first comfort, which it is. It's comforting, nurture, nurturing. We do get a dopamine hit. A dopamine hit is a happy hormone, regardless of whether or not it's um, misplaced, if you will. It's a happy hormone. It feels good. That rush of new love, that's what it is. So, so getting that dopamine hit is, is one of the main reasons we go to the food. And we went to the food initially because we were young and we didn't have anything else available to us. We had no other things to get excited about. We couldn't plan, you know, a weekend away because we were three. We couldn't plan, you know, or do or go anywhere without parental support. And often our parental support was lacking. It wasn't working for us, whatever, for whatever reason, we didn't get what we needed and we got it with food. So it was our first thing that we went to. It's also a dopamine hit. So when we go again and again and again and again and again, we've developed this incredible Grand Canyon of neural pathway. Right now, many of us have a glass bridge over the Grand Canyon, <laughs> trying desperately to cross over to that with, with the panic associated with, with this business. This is white knuckling it. That's what. So the dopamine hit also does this thing that I found out last night. Who knows about the default mode network? The default mode network is that is that voice that we hear when things are quiet for even a second. Like if you're doing an algebra equation and then you do another algebra equation, you're going to get a default mode network comment or two in between. But you're not going to get one when you're doing the algebra equation. You're not going to get a default mode network comment when you're playing video games. You're not going to get a default mode network comment when you're watching television mindlessly. You're not going to get um, a default mode network comment when you're... <laughs> Um, eating peanut butter, huh? Eating peanut butter out of the jar. Well, this is why, and this is something I just learned last night. Because we can mindlessly and numbingly and food foggingly eat peanut butter out of the jar. But guess what? When we get a dopamine hit, it shuts off the default mode network. I just learned this last night. I just lost my shit. I'm like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> and it was a recorded call from 2016. So I couldn't ask her any questions, but what struck me about it was that, was that when we're in, a, when we've had a really hard day, when one thing after another has been hit us, even if we haven't had a really hard day, even if it's just long, even if it's just, oh my gosh, I've, you know, I've had a series of you know, this or that, or, or it's something that we just normally like to do. We're activating um, 
dopamine when we go to food. And we're deactivating the default mode network for just a little bit. That's why it feels so good for a little bit. That's why it's numbing. That's why it's quiet. That's why there's fog. It's numbing. And that's why it also doesn't feel good after a while because it didn't work over time. Question. So the default mode network is the, the critical voice that you hear once you've gone into the food and or the, de the default mode network is a, is a, is a, is a series of places. So there are many networks that we have. I don't have a list of them, but there are many net networks that we have that do different things. So there's, there's connectivity in the brain, depending on, um, depending on what it is you're doing. There's, there's the vagus nerve, for instance, that connects to the, to the, to the gut. There's, there's different aspects. The default mode network in particular is a, is a reptilian. Um, it connects our reptilian. There's no empathy. So it's not connected to any of our em empathy centers. It's connected in order specifically to keep us in community, to keep us safe. So it alerts us when we're, um, when, when we are doing something outside of what we think needs to keep us safe. So think about, um, uh, think about a time when you felt like you had, um, you were in class and you, and you did something and you felt really stupid. The default met the mode network is going to take note of that and remind you not to never do that again because it brought you out of community. It made you unsafe. There are other, there are many, I, there are many examples that I can give you, but in essence, what it does is it, um, it alerts you when you're out of um, bounds. bounds. And it's also got this running tape. It's the Michael Singer. It's the running tape that we hear when it's quiet. It's one of the reasons we have such struggles with meditation. It's the reason that guided meditations are sometimes easier because our default met mode network is offline when we're listening to someone else talk. The default mode network is generally critical because we start out with that feeling that, oh, I did this wrong or I did this wrong, blaming ourselves for everything that has happened to us when we were young, um, taking that information and shifting our, um, our nervous system to accommodate um, a, a, a non-responsive mom. If mom doesn't respond to us laughing, we're not gonna laugh. If mom, if mom uh, doesn't come and pick us up when we're crying, we're gonna shift and adjust our behavior and, and go internal and, not, and, and cry internal instead of out. So the default mode network, that's what, that's what Sarah Payton talks about in the resonant, your resonant self is talking about warming that to a place where you feel self-compassion. You, f There are many of us who have real trouble with self-compassion, real trouble with, with feeling good about anything that we've done. We're so quick to judge ourselves. We're so quick to be critical of something that happened and blame ourselves for it. That's the default mode network taking the this, this safer road, the, the, the makes sense. We're going to take our own responsibility. It's the only thing we can do. We can't change anyone else. We can only change ourselves. So if we assume that we've done these wrong things, then, then our default mode network is just going to keep reminding us. That's why there's such an inner critic among so many of us that are food challenged. So the default mode network is a series of, of messages that come to us regularly in the quiet. It's also a beautiful place that talks about the few that, that helps us, um, helps us dream. It's a creative place. So think about when you're bored. We were just reading about this yesterday. Think about when you're bored. It can be really uncomfortable to be sitting and be bored but it can also be the spark of a place of beauty and transformation and, um, and creativity by just sitting in that boredom. But sitting in that boredom requires listening to that default mode network. But 
what tell me how what the amygdala 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 has to do with is it part of this default network well when we're in fight flight or freeze the amygdala is active and the prefrontal cortex is inactive there there are separate components that unfortunately work really well together when we can when we can recognize oh i'm so sorry that of co- of course you feel scared of course you feel sad of course you feel upset of course you feel sick when we can resonate in our own warmth we have the capacity to to shift that voice from a critical why did you just do that to a wow i wonder why you did that <laughs> we can shift it and that's where we're pulling things out of the amygdala slowly but surely when we can recognize that that was a that was a traumatic event or when we can recognize in the afternoon or the evening i anticipate that i'm going to run into these things so i'm going to do some things in advance that are going to help me not feel so depleted at the end of the day think about your vibrational um space when we're in that um low vibration that scarcity that feeling of uh depletion that pulls us easier into the food we don't want to listen to the default mode network we don't even realize oh if i get a dopamine hit it's going to shut that thing off for a little while but it is and it's just some it's a miracle that i heard it last night i can't even tell you how important that is for me so recognizing that that these things are happening and being able to sit back and notice them even after the fact is beautiful reviewing reviewing circumstances and then and then recognizing okay what 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 about this precursor what can i do to help that's why i talk so much about front loading joy because you're raising you're keeping your vibration high susan talks about it in the in keeping the sine wave up right it's the same concept you're raising your vibrational energy and keeping it higher it doesn't mean that you're not passionate or angry or upset about things but you're just not depleted so that so you can do it ahead of time uh huh how does that that's interesting that you can do it ahead of time Well, think about think about your ca- your body as a car and the more gas you can fill into it or electricity if we're if we're carbon footprinted. Um uh, think about how much um it, the the more you plug in to raising your vibrational energy during the day, think about it. The better you feel. I just need to look at the time. I've got to go. The better you feel about about the better you are the higher vibration you are by the time that you get to that evening time you are still tired your body needs rest but so the, the higher I mean, the vibrational level is the less need you ne- the less you have a need for a dopamine hit right low vibration as things like um uh bullying someone or um uh uh complaining whining uh those are all low vibration um yeah. feeling sorry for yourself i'm not saying that isn't an important thing but it is low vibration so recognizing mm-hmm. and honoring that i'm in a place right now where i really need some more self love i really need some more connection i really recognizing in the moment is challenging because you're in the amygdala that's where sticky notes come in <laughs> sticky notes pull us out because we have to read it. Yeah. Sticky notes pull us out of that space. It may not be attractive to your, you know, beautifully a, a, uh, appointed kitchen, but I'm telling you, sticky notes are really helpful. What do I really want right now? How can I be kind to myself? what would bring me joy yeah i know eva <laughs> i know just to give you all hope 
I am taking a year long course with Sarah Payton and I am going to be starting a major change book club um, starting probably in February. That is all about your resident self and the workbook. So this is about the work that we're talking about here. This is a combination of science um, and behavioral modification based on loving, supportive behavior. <laughs>